And here we go. The slides are up. Lauren, take it away. Thank you very much. And thank you very much to uh, everybody joining me this evening uh, to kind of take a look at some of these weird and wonderful creatures that I've spent the uh, last few years looking at. So what I wanted to do, first of all, was talk a little bit about, about light and how animals sense light in general. So light is one of the, the most important and, and most ubiquitous uh, cues in, in the world for all kind of biological systems. There are very few organisms on Earth that can't sense light in, in some way, and it can provide cues for all sorts of really important um, behaviours and um, ecological aspects of an animal's life. So we really need to kind of get to grips with a lot of these senses if we're going to understand uh, how animals experience their world and, and what kind of guides them through it. So light can provide information regarding all sorts of different aspects of their lives. So that could be, um, you know, keeping their daily rhythms in check, navigating, uh, finding a mate, um, or finding a tasty snack. All of these things are really important to their ecology, their behaviour, and ultimately their evolution. So really by kind of understanding how they experience their world, we can then learn a lot more about all of these different aspects of their biology as well. I wanted to start off by just talking about some of the properties of light. So if we imagine um, you know, light as a simple wave, there's three kind of major aspects that animals could pick up on that are kind of bits of information embedded in that. And these things are wavelength, polarization, and intensity. So if we think about wavelength to begin with, we, we interpret visible wavelengths as color. So in this diagram, you can see that a slightly longer wavelength, so these more stretched out curves, uh, towards the kind of red end of the spectrum and ultimately into the infrared and eventually radio. Uh, and as things get shorter, we get into greens, blues, ultraviolet, and eventually x-rays. Intensity is really just about you know, the, the, the number of photons available. So in a particularly bright system, there'll be a large number of, of photons, and in a dim system, there'll be relatively fewer. Polarization is maybe a little bit less familiar. So if you imagine we're looking at our wave uh, kind of slightly um, you know, off angle, you can see that it's oscillating along a particular plane. So in most light and unpolarized light, that actually can happen around a number of different planes. So you have this kind of you know, rotation around a single axis. We, we as humans can't see polarization, but what we can you know, uh, know that it's there, what we can notice is that if you put on a pair of polarized sunglasses, um, the world will get a little bit dimmer. And what's happening here is that all of that kind of off angle light is being cut out by a linear filter. And you're just then seeing one plane of polarization from one of these. So how do animals actually sense all of this light? So most, most visual systems, certainly most animal visual systems, use uh, a combination of an, an opsin protein and retinal, this kind of small molecule that's in the center here. And what basically happens is that when um, a photon hits this complex, or several photons hit this complex, the retinal changes shape. And that then kind of induces a change in shape um, alongside the entire protein. And this uh, triggers a kind of signaling cascade inside the cell that may eventually then lead to a nerve impulse. So that's the kind of nuts and bolts of how you might pick up light as, a, as an animal cell. Now these opsins are really ubiquitous. Again, they're very widespread in the animal kingdom uh, and they can be finely tuned to detect different wavelengths or different colors as we were talking about earlier. So just by adjusting one or two pieces of this protein, one or two amino acids, we can tune it to um, you know, detect uh, shorter wavelengths. So in this particular example, you can see there's a short wavelength or blue sensitive, mid wavelength or yellow sensitive and long wavelength or red sensitive sensitive opsin in the system. So that would give color vision with three colors, just like our own eyes. As I said, opsins are found in most animals and that means there's a huge array of different proteins across the animal kingdom. They're adjusted to, uh, to detect everything from kind of UV all the way through to the infrared. There are lots of different types that fulfill lots of different tasks. So they're an incredibly uh, diverse, but very conserved protein, which can be very useful for us as we'll come to you later. So what is vision? Because vision isn't just sensing light. So if you imagine you have a single cell, your cell contains a bunch of opsin, it's going to be light sensitive. But if that's all you have, that cell can detect light coming in from any angle. And that might be fine. It depends what your task is. If you just want to know whether it's day or night, or whether you're you know, hidden under a rock or exposed on the sea floor, that's fine. All you need to know is light and dark. But if you want to start gathering spatial information, for example, about the world around you, you can't just be able to detect light coming in from every which way. So what most systems do in this case is start to screen their photoreceptors. So in this example, you can see there's a bunch of small gray dots which represent uh, pigment granules or pigmented cells. And this constrains the angle from which light can actually reach the photoreceptor, meaning that it's only sampling a very specific part of the visual scene. This in essence creates a, a pixel. Um, you can 
sample a certain area of the scene in front of you and know exactly how light or dark it is in that area. And once you start to kind of build up more of these cells and more of this screening, tightening the screening, you can have, end up with multiple pixels and eventually start to kind of form an image. And this is what we're really talking about when we talk about vision, this spatial resolution of where light is. And, you know, vision is a very ancient uh, evolutionary innovation. So those of you who were here for some of the first animals lecture series will recognize this picture. Uh, it's a reconstruction of the Cambrian of Yunnan in China. Uh, and you can see here that even 520 million years ago, you have um, organisms such as this on a Cadictian in the middle and the uh, effective allure at the top there, which both have um, either eye spots or actually already quite a complex compound eyes. So this is a really ancient ability. Since then, in the you know, following half a billion years, we've then seen an enormous diversity of eye structures evolve kind of across the animal kingdom. We're pretty sure that um, eyes themselves have actually appeared more than 40 times across the entire animal tree and an enormous variety of, kind of shapes and forms, some of which you can see here. If we think about how vision works and the kind of parameters that define it, it's a little bit more complicated than when we were just talked about the properties of light earlier, but obviously some of those do kind of come into play. So wavelength and colour we've already spoken about, but obviously if you have uh, different cells that are sensitive to different wavelengths, you might then be able to have colour vision. Polarisation, as we discussed, uh, different cells may be able to detect different angles of light, different planes. Field of view is essentially just where that particular eye is looking, so what part of the visual scene you're sampling. And, oops, sorry. And the resolution is essentially how um, narrow or how wide each pixel is. So again, the, kind of, the narrower your photoreceptor, the finer your resolution, the more detail you're going to be able to um, detect in your image. And finally, sensitivity. So how many photons you really need to absorb before a response is triggered. So if you're not very sensitive, your, light, your sight in the dark is going to be very poor. And you're going to miss out on more detail and more contrast. Most of these things we've actually learned from what we kind of think of as conventional visual systems. So animals that have a, a pair of eyes, like ourselves, uh, and like this owl that you see here. But that doesn't actually reflect the kind of full diversity of visual systems. And this is what I'm really excited about as a visual biologist, is looking at all of these different animals that have kind of thrown out that blueprint and gone, I want more, more is more, I'll have more eyes. So all of these um, examples that you can see here are kind of spread across the animal kingdom. They have all sorts of different approaches to vision. Uh, and some of them have tens or even hundreds of eyes, sometimes spread across the entire body. So just as a kind of couple of examples to get us started, um, this starfish, for example, has five compound eyes. So um, starfish actually all have a single eye at the end of each arm. You can see here in the, the central image at the top, it's a kind of orangey uh, tentacle tip. You can see perhaps those little orange rings. Those are kind of created by the, the pigment that is then surrounding each of those, each of those pixels in the eye. Now we know that although they're relatively simple, starfish can use this not only to kind of work their way back to the safety of a reef if they're displaced, but they can actually, even if they're walking over an obstacle, they stabilize their gaze as they're doing it. So it's actually quite a sophisticated visual behavior, even for something relatively simple. Um, looking at scallops as well, so which might be familiar to you as a you know, delicious, uh, dish, delicious dish, uh, what we've actually got here is we can see that uh, scallops have tens or even hundreds of these tiny but bright blue eyes kind of spread across the, the mantle, so the kind of rim of the, of the two shells here. If you look at this cross section, there's a quite an interesting thing about scallop eyes. They've actually got two retinas, so two layers of photoreceptor cells, which are kind of highlighted here in blue. So what the scallop eye does, which is quite interesting, is that it has um, a, a first retinal layer and then a second underneath. There's then a, a kind of a concave mirror at the very base of the eye which reflects light back up into the, the proximal retina. So the bottom left here, you can see that they actually see two different images at the same time. Finally, as a kind of, you know, uh, another quick example, jellyfish. So another thing that you may not necessarily have thought of as being a visual creature. So box jellyfish actually have 24 eyes of four different types um, arranged in these kind of strange blobs called repelia around the edge. So you can see here that um, the upper lens eye, so at the very top here, looks directly upwards of the animal. We now know that they, this is used for uh, kind of helping the animal maintain its preferred habitat around the very fringes of mangrove swamps. The lower lens eye uh, looks kind of down into the water column and looks like it's probably going to be helping the animal to avoid obstacles while it's swimming. So this is all well and good, you know, there is clearly a very widespread um, and common evolutionary phenomenon, but why go down this route? Why, um, you know, to expend energy on having five eyes or eight eyes or a hundred eyes 
when you know we can certainly do everything we need with two and we're very visual creatures we have a lot of demands a lot of needs and we can meet all of those with a single pair of eyes having two is great because it means you're protected against you know damage to one uh it means that you can uh you can benefit from things like depth perception uh you can set some motion more easily but are there really kind of benefits beyond having two that um really promote a lot of these animals having more than that what's the real reason And if we look at um, you know, the animal tree, it's actually a really common solution. So this is a, a phylogeny, a, a tree of life of most major animal groups. And just for a bit of orientation, uh, we're here in the chordates. And a couple of uh, familiar systems might then be in arthropods, so insects and spiders, and in mollusks, so things like our scallops, um, squids, and clams. And if we actually have a look at where in the animal tree we see these um, duplicated visual systems, actually incredibly common. So eight out of the 10 largest animal groupings show some evidence or some instances of having these duplicated visual systems. And we know that it's also a, quite an ancient solution because we see in particularly virgin shale um, uh, fossils, such as this Opavinia, that you do actually have very, very ancient instances of having more than two eyes as well. So Opavinia famously has five um, putative compound eyes, but we don't know what they're using them for. So this all seems like a massive kind of blur of diversity and uh, perhaps a little bit um, kind of confusing to begin with. But the more we look at you know, the animals that have these systems and these systems themselves, uh, a pattern kind of starts to emerge. And I, I think what the way I see it, you can kind of sort these things into three kind of main groups. So first of all, we have these animals that have uh, large numbers of identical visual units. So these are what we call multiplied visual systems. So they'll have the same structure repeated over and over again, possibly across the body. We also have systems where there's more than one type of eye working. So you might have one type of eye sensing something and one type of eye sensing something else. We also have what's uh, kind of known as extraocular visual systems. Now these are still pretty mysterious, so we'll come to them at the end of the talk. Um, but this is an instance in which we're not really sure whether they have one eye or several eyes or no eyes at all, but that vision still seems to be um, you know, within the capacity of these animals. So what I'm going to do this evening is just kind of take you through um, an example of each of these and try and see if we can reach any kind of overarching conclusions that bring the three of them together. So if we start off with multiplied visual systems, for example, we've already spoken about the, the scallop and the starfish, um, but there's all sorts of other examples as well. So here you can see also um, a fan worm, a cebellid worm, uh, and at the bottom of every kind of pink stripe that you can see on the, the fan of the worm there is a small pair of very simple eyes. You can also see a strepsipteran at the very top here, which has lots of eyelets, so kind of miniature eyes, uh, in place of the you know, compound eyes that we're familiar with in a lot of other insects. So if we think about our kind of five visual parameters and how these uh, might help us kind of better understand multiplied visual systems, because we know we have identical visual units, we know that the sampling parameters, so things like sensitivity and polarization, should be identical across all of them. So this means that if we really want to understand what's happening in these systems, uh, and how information across these eyes is being combined, this field of view that's going to give us the kind of uh, the most information to go on, the, the best clue to how these animals are experiencing their world and why they're replicating the same eye over and over again. And this is a kind of common misconception even in insect compound eyes, is that you know you may be forming hundreds and hundreds of images that look in a very slightly different place. But certainly in insect compound eyes, even though this is you know what comes through your lenses. The animal then builds a single picture out of all of these tiny images. So what is happening? So if we imagine, for example, that we have an animal with three eyes, all three eyes do the same job. And so let's say that animal is looking at Academy Award winning actor Nicolas Cage. What does that animal see? So if all three eyes are kind of sampling, um, you know, overlapping fields of view, they might all see very slightly different pictures of Nicolas Cage, you know, ranging from the top to the bottom. And this could have all sorts of benefits. It, it offers redundancy. So if one of the eyes gets um, you know, uh, damaged or, or pulled off, then they can still see Nick with the other two. It could also mean that they're able to more easily detect things like motion and depth. Alternatively, those three eyes could be looking at different parts of him. So in this case, you've got one looking at his forehead and one at his shirt. And ultimately, that could mean that they firstly cover a larger field of view in total. Um, and secondly, that they could create a composite image um, covering him with a bit more detail. So the animals I'm going to um, use to kind of illustrate um, some of this work is the chitin. So chitons are mollusks. Uh, you can probably find them in most uh, rock pools in the UK if you go looking for them. 
Um, you can see in the top right, this is the, the underneath, the ventral view of mollusk. You can see a big muscular foot, uh, lots of gill pairs either side, and a mouth at the top. And at the bottom, we've got, got some nice examples of how kind of colourful and beautiful and varied they can be. You can see that they're covered by these eight kind of dorsal shells, and they're really important to this. So those shells in all mollusks are kind of filled with pores, sensory pores that detect things like uh, chemicals, uh, movement, and potentially light. But in some species, um, they've actually added what's this kind of small circular lens to the top of some modified pores. And this is an entirely new instance of an eye that occurs in several species of chitons. Now, thanks to the work of um, Dan Spicer and some of his colleagues, we know that each individual one of these eyes is able to detect, uh, sorry, is able to form an image of its own. So in the bottom right here, you can see that a single eye would form a somewhat blurry image, but certainly an image of a potentially frightening fish predator here. Um, and we know that the entire animal is able to respond to this um, because they, the, in the top left here, what we're seeing is that animals will respond to a circular target being prevent, uh, presented overhead by clamping down onto the substrate. Uh, but you can see at the bottom half of that diagram that they don't respond in the same way if you just turn the lights down a little bit. So they are using image formation to guide their behaviour and not just light and dark. So really the question here is, OK, we know that we get one picture, but what would a chitin see? Would a chitin see one picture of Nicolas Cage or would a chitin see 300 tiny Nicolas Cages? I believe there's a poll here, so I'm curious to see what you all think of it. But uh, let me know which you think is going to be uh, more likely for this uh, lucky chitin. So now that we know something about individual eyes and how they work, you wanted to kind of like zoom out and look at the big picture. How do all of these eyes then kind of fit together? So using this particular species, Tunichia de Brunei, we've started looking at a growth series and how animals add eyes throughout their lives. So these two individuals that you can see, there's a, an adult on the right-hand side and a tiny little baby on the left-hand side, but you can see that they both have these um, little dark dots, which is where all the eyes are. And as I said, they add these eyes continuously throughout their lives. Chitons kind of grow pretty much um, indeterminately throughout their life. And they seem to steadily add numbers as they get longer. So what we wanted to look at, first of all, was whether this is a, a regular network. So you can see that the eyes are quite beautifully arranged into these rays that kind of come out across the shells. And we wanted to know whether or not those are, kind of, are equally spread out, if they add more eyes as they grow older, or if they kind of slow down. And we kind of detected this by trying to measure from the, the centre of every valve sequentially to each eye to see if we get this kind of nice curving pattern or a linear relationship that would indicate having a regular addition. And what we find is that they, they certainly don't slow down their addition of eyes. Uh, it's kind of equivocal as to whether it's a regular addition or if they accelerate slightly. But what we do certainly see is they are adding our eyes pretty regularly and they're fairly evenly spaced across the shell. You can also see that they're pretty symmetrical. So there's very few instances of higher than kind of 10% discrepancy between the left and right sides, which might sound like a lot, but if you have you know, up to 600 eyes, that's, that's pretty good going if you're adding them throughout your life. So we do see that we have this very kind of regular, evenly spaced network that these chitons are using across their whole body. But what about the actual field of view? So just because they're spread out regularly doesn't necessarily mean that their sampling is seen regularly. So what we did next was uh, take a bunch of these valves uh, and essentially micro-CT them, so we've kind of been able to generate these 3D models of what the valves look like. So on this one, you'll be able to see in pink here, which is where every single eye is. And what we did was then look a little bit closer at every eye. You can see in the bottom right-hand side here, uh, an X-ray section through that shell. And you can see just about the, the shape kind of reflected from that diagram that I showed you earlier. So there's a lens at the top and then a cavity that contains the retina, the photoreceptors at the bottom. And so the original authors of, of the previous article estimated that the, the nodal point, the point at which the light kind of crosses over, uh, is probably in the, the centre or the lower third of, of the lens there. So what we can do is take that uh, hypothetical nodal point and then try and work out how much light could reach uh, you know, the, the entire retina by passing through that point and project outwards what the field of view might be for that particular eye. And if we do that for all of the eyes um, across half a valve, this is what we get. So every coloured cone here is the visual field of a single eye. So what we can see, um, and I'm giving you some orientation at the bottom there, the whole animal is uh, head facing to the left. And if we have a look from the underneath, again, head to the left, 
we can see that there's a, a gradual shift in what part of the visual scene those eyes are sampling. So the oldest eyes are here in red and the youngest eyes are in purple. So this kind of shift from looking backwards and outwards to looking forwards and more kind of towards the centre as the animal grows older. And if you start to look at both halves of the, the shell together, so we've now kind of rotated through 90 degrees and we're looking head on at the animal, you can see that there's actually quite a lot of overlap as well between the two halves of the vowel, again with the uh, oldest eye in red and the youngest eye in purple. So this actually creates a pretty broad strip directly dorsal of the animal that's being sampled by almost every eye in the visual system. And as we know, that can be up to kind of, you know, five, six hundred eyes in some case, which is an enormous amount of oversampling for such a supposedly simple system. It might be that this is the most important area to sample, of course. Um, you know, we think that the chitin visual system is there primarily to um, enact defensive responses against overhead predators such as this fish. So how would a chitin then probably see Nicholas Cage if Nicholas Cage was to, you know, wander over to it in a rock pool and try and pick it up? We know that actually all of these eyes are probably massively oversampling here. So I think what we, what we, what we expect to see is that we don't actually uh, have one single image of Nicholas Cage forming. It's probably going to be hundreds and hundreds of smaller ones. And from what we know about the chitin nervous system, uh, this perhaps shouldn't come as too much of a surprise. So if we were to expect these animals to kind of stitch together one larger uh, image, it would, it would take quite a lot of kind of computational power, quite a lot of processing here. So if we uh, if we actually piece together um, all of those images, it would take quite a lot of uh, brain power. And unfortunately, that's not really something that these animals have. So they do have a brain. They have this kind of uh, you know concentration and organization of, of neural tissue, but they uh, they probably don't have the smarts to piece together a six hundred piece jigsaw puzzle. So at least um, you know, with, with chitons in particular, as our example of a, a multiplied visual system, what we've kind of deduced is that they do have uh, regular sampling, they've got regularly spaced eyes, they've got almost total coverage of the, uh, the global field of view, but we see really high redundancy. And that seems like quite a strange thing when you're pouring so much energy into having you know, so many hundreds of eyes. But actually, given that we know that this response is really important, if it's you know, one of your only kind of defenses against approaching predators, uh, maybe it's really worthwhile investing that effort in a kind of reliable visual system. So having high redundancy can protect you from things like false alarms. There could be you know, a piece of detritus floating past in one of your eyes, protecting you from biofouling, from damage to your eyes, and of course improved sensitivity as well. So just because they're not, just because we don't think they're combining everything into one image, doesn't necessarily mean that uh, they uh, they're not kind of relying on multiple eyes being triggered in order to, in order to trigger a response. Okay, so let's kind of make things a little bit more complicated. So that was having lots of replicates of the same kind of eye, but what if we're thinking about parallel systems, these kind of multiple eye types? And all this might sound unusual, it's actually, again, surprisingly common. So even some things that uh, you will have come across uh, pretty regularly, so things like insects, have two parallel visual systems. So as well as having the two compound eyes that are very familiar with on the side of the head, most insects, and certainly most flighted insects, have an additional visual system these kind of three small dots that you can see in the center of the head here called the ocelli. And these kind of provide uh, everything from flight stabilization to horizon detection to polarization possibly as well. So they fulfill a wide range of roles. But we do see this kind of same uh, approach in lots of different animals as well. So unlike multiplied systems, there's a whole lot more variables at play here. So because we can have different functionalities, we could have different color sensitivity, different polarization sensitivity, different resolution and field of view across all of these kind of different systems. There's quite a lot happening that we need to get to grips with. So this time, it could be that one eye is seeing a beautifully well-resolved, fine detailed picture of Nick Cage, but it's all in black and white. And it could be that our second visual system is actually seeing a pretty crummy picture, but does all the kind of color recognition. But this kind of seems strange to us because we can see Nick Cage perfectly fine in full color and full detail with just one pair of eyes. So why, why end up with two eyes doing the same job that one eye could do? And this is a question that I'm going to use to uh, use spiders to kind of address. And this is, this is your trigger warning for any arachnophobes who are in the audience, the cutest spider that I could find on the internet. Um, but there are a couple of pretty gnarly ones coming up in a moment, so look away. 
Spiders really are the kind of masters of, of having parallel visual systems. And they, they have an enormous variety of um, eye distributions, uh, eye parameters, uh, size, even number, uh, which makes them the kind of perfect system to then look at you know, why you would uh, use different structures to uh, detect different cues. As a kind of basic primer for spider eyes, um, this, uh, you have kind of four, you know, most spiders have four pairs of eyes of two different types. So you have the, the principal eyes, which you can see in the bottom left here, or the anterior median eyes. These are essentially how you would design an eye, with the light sensitive part facing outwards. But they also have up to three pairs of secondary eyes. So this um, has the photoreceptors inverted and then has a, a tapetum or a concave mirror, just like the scallop does, and just like a cat's do as well. And there's an enormous amount of variation on this basic blueprint. And spiders have done some really amazing stuff with this as well. They have some real kind of visual Olympians. So a couple of examples here, you can see that um, for the color coordination, there's a lot of different uh, configurations of the same structures over and over. They use them for wildly different things. So jumping spiders, which you've probably heard of, uh, have super high resolution vision in their anterior median eyes, their principal eyes, uh, thanks to this kind of amazing telephoto style eye that they have. Uh, and they, this means they've got um, they great vision, they can use it for very sophisticated tasks. Uh, in this particular example, you can see an extremely sexy dance from this uh, male jumping spider who's courting a female. They have a lot of visual communication, which is pretty, um, pretty special and pretty unusual. As a second example, we have this ogre faced spider. So spiders also hold the record for the most sensitive eyes that we know of in the animal kingdom. So these guys have kind of uh, you know, issued hunting from a web that's just waiting for prey to come along. Uh, and instead, uh, they'll spin this kind of gladiator's net type web. They'll hold between their kind of two forelegs and in pitch black, they'll be able to catch a prey. So they have incredibly sensitive uh, posterior, median, or secondary eyes. But it's not all spiders have amazing vision, and that's fine. Obviously, every visual system has to do the job that's necessary to the animal with that visual system. And so the two examples I've just given you, they're both kind of very visual animals, they have incredible eyes. But most spiders, you know, don't necessarily need vision that much. And that's why these guys are a perfect group to look at the evolution of parallel systems. They have everything from uh, web-based hunters who really don't have that much use for vision at all, all the way through to these champions like Dinopis and like the jumping spider. What's really useful in this particular setting is that uh, a, lot of, a lot of what we know about eyes means that we can uh, learn or infer a lot about their function just by looking at their structure. And partly this is thanks to you know, decades and decades of uh, studies um, by other biologists and partly down to some of the laws of physics as well. So for example, we uh, imagine we have a, a simple camera eye like this. It's looking at a black and white grating. And we can basically deduce from the spacing of the photoreceptors in the retina and their distance from this nodal point in the lens. We can then calculate what's called the, the interoceptor angle. So the angle that one particular pixel will um, occupy in an image. And from this, we can work out what the, the maximum uh, resolution of that particular eye is. So what is the finest detail that it could really pick out? Uh, and in this case, that would be the distance between this black and this white part of the grating here. All of these kind of functional relationships that we know about eyes is really helpful from the kind of um, the study of uh, you know, visual evolution, because it means that we can actually learn a lot about uh, things like sensitivity, polarization sensitivity, and resolution just from looking at structure. So one of the things that we've been doing is then uh, you know, taking spiders from our own museum collections and from several other collections around the world and trying to look at and compare all of their eye structures across kind of large, uh, large, large distances in terms of their uh, relatedness. So here you can see uh, we've taken a spider for collections and at the bottom right here, uh, you can see in a, a tube with a pink arrow, there is one tiny spider head inside this enormous machine uh, which is based at the Synchrotron, which is uh, essentially a particle accelerator, uh, which we visited once in Oxfordshire at Diamond Light Source and once in Switzerland at the Swiss Light Source. So I mentioned CT scanning earlier and this kind of ability to you know, use X-rays to get three-dimensional images. The Synchrotron is basically a, a really, really souped-up CT scanner. So that kind of ring-shaped uh, building is a particle accelerator, and uh, there'll be a kind of a, a beam line that comes off that that produces really uh, high energy, specific energy x-rays. So what we can see um, that will have a, a, I believe we'll have a video, there we go. Um, what we can see here is an example of one of the scans that's produced by the synchrotron. So this is us passing through the head of a spider, you can see the two fangs in the middle, 
two eyes appearing, and then two more pairs of eyes at the very bottom there. And if we zoom in a little bit more, we can actually see that we get really gorgeous detail um, out of these scans, which only take a few minutes to take. So here you can see we've got the, the lens, the vitreous body, and this kind of black and white stripey U shape at the bottom here, which is the retina. So you can see that there's these kind of, uh, there's a pale layer with those dark dots. Every one of those dark dots is an individual photoreceptor cell. The kind of pale layer surrounding it is the screening pigment that we were talking about. So from these scans, we can extract a lot of data. We can uh, deduce things like interreceptor angle, which we talked about earlier. We can look at things like uh, rhabdom length and rhabdom diameter. So but again, both things that influence how sensitive a particular photoreceptor is. We can look at the potential focusing optics of the lens, so looking at the radius of curvature, the aperture diameter, so how much light can actually enter the eye, and of course the diameter and the thickness of the lens itself. And once we've got all this, um, these image stacks, we can actually not just be restricted to fit them in 2D as we might do by um, you know, dissections or uh, histology, but actually look at the eye in its full kind of three-dimensional context. You know, what direction is it looking in? How, does, uh, how do all of these parameters change across the retina, for example, which is a really invaluable tool. So I'm not going to uh, dwell too much on kind of individual uh, adaptations here, but I just really wanted to demonstrate how much variation we see across all of these different structures. So this is uh, principal eyes taken from eight completely different families of spiders. You can see that we've got an enormous kind of range of morphology, both in terms of shape and size, the position of the retina. Um, and again, it looks like we have very kind of uh, different uh, resolutions as well, the different spacings. And this isn't just the case in the principal eyes, even in these posterior laterals, which are one of the secondary eye pairs. Again, we see kind of enormous diversity uh, between all of these different families. Uh, needless to say, we've kind of come across a few interesting tidbits while we've been like surveying all of these, uh, you know, many, many dozens and even hundreds of scans. And just to give you a kind of uh, little flavor of some of the things that we found, it's a couple of examples here. So in the top right, we have um, a gyroneta aquatica, which is the only kind of fully aquatic spider, spends the majority of its life underwater. Uh, it spins basically a little, uh, little silk sac that surrounds the abdomen here. And you can see there's a kind of air bubble trapped within that. So spider lungs are, are located in the abdomen. So this allows it to, to breathe while it's doing its business underwater. And what we found in this particular spider is uh, unlike its close relatives, which will have pretty you know, relatively shoddy vision and quite flat, uh, not particularly curved lenses, is that we can see in the, uh, the, the left image here, uh, sorry, in the uh, bottom left of that blue panel, we've got these kind of almost spherical lenses in the principal eyes here, which are very different from the other eyes, as you can see at the top. So this is something that we see very commonly in, in other aquatic systems. So things like fish have really spherical lenses, octopus have very spherical lenses as well. So actually, it's uh, probably an adaptation to, to, to being underwater. So the, the focusing power of the lens is massively reduced if you're underwater because the, the refractive index of the water and the lens are very, very similar. Whereas for us, the refractive index of um, air and our lenses is much higher. So we don't need them to be quite as, as thick or as rounded. In the bottom left, the kind of orange panel here is a, a different example. So this is Zadarian, which is an ant hunting spider. Uh, they have this fabulous uh, lifestyle where they build themselves a, a tiny igloo out of stones uh, and they venture out of their igloo, they go hunting for ants uh, and then they work their way back to their igloos um, at, the, at the end of their hunt. And they do seem to be able to navigate their way back without too much trouble, which is kind of a curious thing. So one of the things that we noticed while we were looking at the, the eyes and reconstructing the eyes of this particular animal is that you'll see under this red lens, we have two layers of retina here. So you'll maybe able to see that the kind of, uh, you know, green and yellow layer is at a right angle-ish to the, the kind of teal and blue layer underneath. And this is really typical of something that we see in animals that have polarization sensitivity. So just by turning the receptors 390 degrees, you can then kind of differentiate between different planes of polarization, which is a really neat trick. For these animals, it might be really useful at getting back to their igloos at, uh, the end of their, at the end of their hunt. So we actually have a, a natural pattern of polarization cast by uh, the sun and the, the moon across the sky which several other animals are known to use to navigate. So it could be that you know, that's how these spiders are getting back to their igloos when they're done feeding. But I mostly want to talk about evolution. So if we start to look at uh, you know, some of these characteristics that we've surveyed across spiders, and then start to uh, you know, try and compare those across different uh, related families, what do we see? So this is another phylogeny, another kind of family tree of all of these different spiders. You can see on the right-hand side, like a little graphic of uh, their kind of eye arrangement and what they look like. So if we just take a couple of basic of, uh, examples here, 
Um, one of the things that we're really interested in is resolution, right? So the finer the resolution, the more detail you can see. So the uh, colored vertical bars here indicate points in evolution where statistically it looks like spiders have crossed that threshold and they've reached a certain uh, resolution. If you want to think about how, uh, you know, three degrees of resolution looks, if you uh, take your little finger and you hold your arm at arm's length, the width of your little fingernail is about one degree. So if you imagine three degrees is actually pretty coarse resolution still, but good for a spider, so we'll take that. As you can see, the instances where this evolves seem to coincide uh, relatively neatly with the uh, estimated origin of webless hunting. So animals leaving the web, going to either, you know, wander to find their prey or actually visually hunting them. So maybe this isn't, you know, a huge surprise. You need vision, you get better vision. We see the same thing with polarization sensitivity. So again, this possible way of navigating, which might suddenly become much more useful once you're leaving your web and going hunting elsewhere. But it's not just a case of, uh, you know, spiders that need better vision, have better vision across the board. That's not necessarily true. So one of the things that we did next was compare uh, a fairly simple metric. So looking at lens diameter, the size of the eye, uh, as kind of a proxy for the investment they made in that eye pair. And you can see here that the, the three families that I've picked out, which are all quite visual hunters, uh, not only do they have, you know, maybe higher investment overall, they actually have much more variable investment. So if you compare, for example, the far left, the Salticids, we've got dramatically different eye sizes compared to, uh, for example, the, the Araneids of the middle there, which are our kind of classic orb weavers, which, you know, in total probably have about the same uh, you know, total diameter of eyes, but it's much more evenly spread. And if we look at sampling parameters, some of the things that we talked about earlier in terms of uh, you know, retinal morphology, we see a very similar pattern. So if we compare rhabdom length, which influences sensitivity, with interrhabdom angle, which influences resolution, you can see that we have this kind of you know, downwards uh, correlation here of these two factors. And if we look at how these different animals hunt, we can see quite an interesting pattern once again. So if we look at the web hunters, so our Araneids and our falsids, you can see that they form two quite uh, quite tight clusters of points here. You'll also notice that in both cases, there are three points that are much closer together than the four. And these three are the, the secondary eye pairs, and the fourth one is the, the primary eye pair. If we look at ground hunters, we suddenly see kind of a much kind of wider distribution, particularly in dictinas. And they kind of stretch out along uh, the kind of lower part of the graph here. If we look at our visual hunters, actually we have the opposites. We have a, a big shift towards the left-hand side, but again, quite a big expansion of all these different uh, combinations of parameters that they capture. So again, we see quite a lot more variation. You know, it's not just it's not just better vision, it's more varied between the eye pairs, despite the fact that these animals are more visually reliant. So let's come to field of view. We've kind of talked about some of these sampling parameters now and, and how they vary between visual and non-visual species. So field of view is something that's quite difficult to, uh, to analyze, I suppose, but we have all of these you know, beautiful models of spider, spider visual systems. And you can see that quite aside from uh, what every resident is looking at, you can also see that the eyes themselves are spread out and sized very differently between these different groups. So we've used a technique called uh, geometric morphometrics to try and get a, a grasp on how those things are spread out and whether or not you know, more visual species have different eye arrangements than less visual species. So the way that this works is that um, from our 3D models, we can place landmarks that will then analyze in a mathematical way. So you can see from these two species, we've placed landmarks um, you know, at the two, two centers and around the edges of the eye. And you can see that they actually represent reasonably the, the shape and distribution and also the orientation of the four eye pairs in these two species. Now, when we place these landmarks, they're done in, uh, so the landmarks has to have to correspond basically between species. So when we put them into the analysis, um, you know, we're aware that the two blue landmarks are absolutely comparable. Both of those would be the center of the principal eyes in whichever species we look at. And both of the pink landmarks are again, the center of the posterior lateral eyes, no matter what species you're looking at. So the, what the analysis does basically is take all of that variation in three dimensions uh, and you know, related to each other and tries to collapse that into a couple of uh, two dimensional uh, parameters that we call principal components. So what you're seeing is a complex, multi-dimensional uh, mathematical problem kind of squashed into 2D. And what happens if we do that is that we, uh, what we can see is that we actually have our, our three hunting groups fall out into quite different spaces. So uh, in pink, we have a, a selection of visual hunters. There's, I think, a, a bunch of different families in there. 
And you can see that they kind of like fall a cluster at the top of the graph here, surrounded by that pink circle. What we see in our web hunters is actually there's, there's not that much overlap between these two. So they're kind of occupying quite different parts of this uh, theoretical shape space. Our ground hunters kind of sit somewhere in between, and they're clearly kind of encompassing a bit of both of them as well. But we can see quite a clear distinction between at least our visual and our web hunter spiders. And this is clear if we look at the models themselves as well. So you can see in the bottom left that um, while our, our web hunters have quite widely dispersed and uh, differently oriented eyes, in our visual hunters, we seem to have much more uh, you know, concentration towards the, the front of the head, as well as seeing this kind of dramatic difference in eye size that we discussed earlier. So what might be happening here is that with our web hunters, you know, we've got actually very distributed fields of view and our two different types of eyes aren't necessarily looking in the same direction. And that's fine. They can be functionally different and looking in different places if that's what's useful to them. So for example, here, um, you know, our principal eyes, our pink eyes might be interested in looking at Nick's facial expression and seeing how he's feeling. But the blue eyes might only be interested in the color of his shirt. And the fact that they don't overlap doesn't mean they're not doing a good job. They're just, you know, completely uh, fulfilling different tasks here. By contrast, a jumping spider might be really interested in how Nicolas Cage is feeling. So, you know, in this example, they're getting both high definition from the principal pair of eyes uh, and color vision from the secondary pair of eyes, both of which in this case are facing forward and sampling the same part of visual space. But this brings us back to the problem we had at the start. If you're using two pairs of eyes to simultaneously sample the same space, why not just collapse it and have a single pair of eyes do the same job? And this is kind of an issue that seems strange to us as humans because we have amazing eyesight, really kind of among animals above best. Part of this is a size issue. So if you compare the size of even a human eye, let alone a human head, to the size of these amazing jumping spider eyes, they're absolutely enormous. And because uh, eyes are constrained by both kind of biological constraints and by optical constraints, this really matters. So we can obviously have an enormous number of uh, photoreceptors giving us very fine resolution. But you can't make those photoceptors infinitely smaller and give you infinitely better resolution if you have a very small eye. You also have a, a shorter focusing distance, um, and this kind of, you know, if your total body size is there, so you can't grow an eye bigger than your own body. So for the spiders, what it seems to be is that the greater your reliance on vision, the greater divergence you're going to have between these parallel systems. But at the same time as having greater functional divergence, you're likely to have greater spatial concentration. So you kind of have these two different forces at play here, which is what seems to have produced things like jumping spiders and wolf spiders that have multiple forward-facing forward pairs of eyes doing very different jobs. And we think that the reason behind this is probably actually a functional constraint purely on size. So finally, I just want to talk to you uh, relatively briefly about these extraocular systems. Which are kind of, there's a slight, slightly mysterious about the beginning, but they remain mysterious, as you'll see in a minute. So these are kind of systems where animals don't appear to have eyes. They don't appear to have discrete organs or focusing optics or any of these things that we would associate with you know, an eye in any other animal. And broadly speaking, this has only really been kind of looked at um, in any depth in sea urchins and brittle stars. So these are both relatives of, of sea stars and starfish that we talked about at the beginning, but they don't have the same compound eyes that the starfish have. So in particular, I want to talk about uh, this one species called Ophiomastix. So this kind of became the, the poster child of looking for extraocular vision because it's, it's very light sensitive. It does this gorgeous kind of color changing trick. So this is the same individual uh, photographed during the day at the top with this kind of dark uh, brown coloration and during the night at the bottom. So it's got this kind of like really uh, pale beige look. They really hate, they hate being exposed to light and they'll kind of crawl away into any crevice uh, at the first opportunity. So these were kind of the uh, the, the, the first place to go looking for vision in an animal without eyes. But of course, if you don't have eyes, we find it very difficult to know what we're looking for. So, you know, first of all, we need to work out, you know, where and how light is detected before you can even start thinking about, you know, what the function might be and how vision might work. So going back to the beginning, we remember that we spoke about opsense being this kind of fairly ubiquitous way of uh, detecting light in visual systems. This is now massively helpful to us because it means that we have a a basic building block that we know that we're looking for. So what we did was, uh, you know, take a couple of arm snips from these animals and sequence the RNA. So uh, this means that we can detect which genes are actually being expressed rather than which genes are actually just available in the genome. So you can tell what a particular tissue type is doing. And what we found uh, is that actually they do have a large number of options. So this is again uh, a phylogeny, but only of the genes. 
Uh, we can do this to look at how different genes are related to each other. The important thing here is that I want to look, you to look at the top. So these two groups of opsins, C and R, are used for vision in the vast majority of animal systems. And what we found was that there are three different R opsins uh, available in this opiomastix arm. Uh, it's actually the, this kind of opsin that most invertebrates use for their vision. So we're like, cool, excellent. Like, this is a pretty promising lead. Let's go looking for some R opsins. So what we used next was a, a, a technique called immunohistochemistry. So this basically means that if you, if you know you're looking for a particular protein, what you can do is, is design an antibody that will bind to that protein. So in the same way as uh, you, know, you might develop antibodies to a particular pathogen, you can design an antibody to uh, attack essentially a protein of your choice. And then you can attach a fluorescent protein to that antibody. And then when you put it under a fluorescent microscope, you'll basically have it light up exactly where that protein is located. So what we're looking at here is the, the arm plate of Ophiomastix. And what we can see in red is where this opsin is being expressed. So just for orientation, in the kind of top right here, you can see uh, a kind of uh, a, a microscope image of the surface of that plate. So we've got lots of kind of calcite bumps with these little pores surrounding them. Uh, and from the uh, fluorescent image, it looks like what we're seeing is the opsin is located within those pores. And if you look at the scale on the top right here, so that's, that scale bar is 10 microns, so 10 one thousandths of a millimeter. This means that these animals have tens of thousands, potentially, of these opsin expressing potentially light sensitive cells spread all across the body. Uh, they work just on the kind of upside, the uh, top side of the arms. We found them on the sides, underneath, all over. So there really are kind of thousands and thousands of these things working. And other animal systems where you have tens of thousands of photoreceptors are usually pretty great. Uh, so things like dragonflies, for example, have incredibly fast, high resolution, very colorful vision. Uh, you know, they have extremely complicated flight behavior that they need to coordinate. So, you know, our brittle stars aren't really doing any of that stuff. So it seems a bit suspicious that they have quite so many photoreceptors. So what are they doing? We spoke at the beginning about, uh, you know, what vision is and why vision has to be different from just detecting light. So this ability to kind of resolve spatially where light is coming from. So we wanted to, you know, just make sure that First of all, this brittle star is actually able to do that. So what we did is uh, this kind of behavioral setup, which I'll uh, talk about a couple of variations on. Essentially what happens is that you have a, a circular arena filled with seawater and the animal is placed in the center. But one side of that arena, you present a, a stimulus, a visual stimulus of some kind. In this case, you can see that it's a, a black bar centered on a, a white bar vertically. The rest of the arena is gray. So what this essentially means is that the, the light reflected by the stimulus, which is black and white, so very light and very dark, on average is about the same as it's reflected by the gray. So if you can't spatially resolve, if you're only detecting kind of you know, directional, it's darker this way, it's lighter this way, you shouldn't be able to detect that stimulus and you should just orient randomly. Because we know that these animals do kind of seek shelter uh, during the day or when they're exposed to light, we hypothesize that they will want to move towards the stimulus if they can not detect it. What we tried was a couple of different variants on this as well. So you'll see at the top, there are these three different stimuli that we kind of tried to feed the animal to see whether um, it would go towards a dark stripe on a white background, this kind of uh, black and white stripe on a gray background, and then a more kind of gradual uh, gradient stimulus. So for the results of these experiments, I'm going to show you plots that look a little bit like this, they're circular plots. So this, imagine if you're looking, uh, you're looking top down at the arena, which is this gray circle. And essentially every pink dot that you can see is one animal and where it ended up at the side. The arrow at the center shows you the kind of uh, mean direction that they moved in and the length of the arrow shows you kind of how strong that response is. The kind of arc around the outside is just a confidence interval for, for that arrow. So this is a control. There was no stimulus uh, present in this particular experiment. And as you can see, the animals didn't really move in any particular direction. They're fairly uh, spread out around the edge and have got a very short arrow. But if we present them with any of our visual stimuli, you can see that there's a slightly different picture. So here again, they're actually much more kind of moving towards uh, the stimuli that are being presented at the top here. And this is cool. This is the, one of the first times that we've ever demonstrated that an animal that doesn't have eyes is able to do this kind of spatial resolution of uh, different parts of the visual scene. And it isn't just moving to like an overall darker or an overall lighter space, which is very exciting. So we thought we'd play around with this a little bit more and try and work out exactly what it is that is, that's the limit of this visual system. So we repeated this experiment uh, with the black and white bars, uh, making them kind of smaller and larger in terms of their angular size. So uh, their angular width as viewed from the center of the arena. And this particular graph, I'm gonna show you percentage of success. So how many animals actually made it to that stimulus 
uh, successfully. As you can see here, we basically see uh, that animals are very happy and very successfully orient to stimuli that are, occupy 50 degrees of their horizon and above. So you can see in our kind of blue and orange lines, uh, random chance, so just like the chance that they would randomly wander into the stimulus without seeing anything, and the actual observed success rate. So you can see that there's quite a clear difference between a 40 degree stimulus, which they seem to be unable to locate, and a 50 degree stimulus, which they're very kind of uh, geared towards, which is really cool. However, 40 degrees, if you remember that, you know, your little finger is one degree, seems really big <laughs> and not particularly useful. So again, this is kind of a lesson in uh, a visual system is good if it is fulfilling its purpose. It doesn't have to be as good as ours. So if we try and uh, imagine what that animal could be seeing, this is an image that was taken from the site where we collect the brittle stars. So you can see these kind of like big coral heads that uh, you know, might provide shelter, perhaps. If we then transform that image so that we uh, kind of uh, simulate a 40 degree resolution and a 50 degree resolution when looking at it, you can see that we lose almost all of the detail. Uh, but certainly with a 40 degree image, if you kind of squint, you can see that there are kind of two very, very coarse, darker blobs where these two coral heads should be. So it could be that even if it is really coarse resolution, it's sufficient to enable them to find them uh, a shelter. So even if it seems, again, like a massive energetic investment, it could be they're gearing towards something very useful. So in terms of how they're doing this, how the vision is facilitated, we turn to look at a closely related species called Ophia camella. So this is an interesting one because uh, Ophia camella appears to have all the same opsins, it has the same opsin expressing cells, it has these photoreceptors, but it doesn't respond to our visual stimuli and it also doesn't like being exposed to light. What it doesn't do is that it doesn't have this fancy color changing trick that Ophia Mastix does, which kind of gave us a clue. So you're like, cool, maybe this color changing is yeah, something to do with the, the pigment and the screening that we said earlier is really necessary for, for vision and for spatial resolution. So we thought we'd go back and use our Ophia Mastix, but at nighttime when it's in this kind of like pale uh, beige form. And sure enough, it doesn't seem to be able to locate the stimuli anymore. So we thought, well, okay, that seems maybe silly because we're trying it at nighttime. There's not enough light available to it. Maybe it just can't see because it's too dark. So we tried a couple of different treatments. Uh, firstly, giving it artificial light at night, and secondly, kind of keeping it keeping it in a dark box so that it would uh, adapt to the darkness, and then running experiments during the day. And neither of these rescued the orientation behavior. So if there is something that the pigment is doing, we need to be able to demonstrate that it's actually starting to you know, restrict the passage of light to those photoreceptors. So we had um, all of our kind of fluorescent microscopy images, we had uh, x-ray data, and we had histology. So what we did was then kind of build these uh, composite models of what the photoreceptor system actually looks like in these three instances. So we have our light-adapted ophiomastics here with kind of pigment granules surrounding the photoreceptors on the left. Our uh, Ophio Camella with no pigment and our uh, Ophio Mastix at uh, night with no pigment on the right hand side. And what we did was then kind of take uh, digital sections through each of those photoreceptors and rotate through 360 degrees, measuring the angles at which light could possibly you know, reach it at incident uh, without being uh, interrupted by an obstacle. And if you plot those angles onto the field of view, so here imagine that a single photoreceptor is at the middle of that sphere. What you can see is that indeed, when you do have pigment, that's a massively constricted area that light can reach that photoreceptor from. So our uh, uh, opium camella and our dark adapted opium mastics, you can see that there's, you know, light can reach that photoreceptor from almost 120 degrees, which is an enormous amount of the visual field. So what it looks like happening here is that we actually have uh, a kind of visual system that's controlled by the movement of this pigment uh, between the surface and the inside of the arm between day and night, which is which is really neat. It looks likely that the photoreceptors themselves, so that the wet sensing cells, are probably fairly common. So you can see that they're in Ophia camella, they may well be in other brittle stars, and it's only the addition of the pigment that really kind of confers this ability to start to discriminate a little bit more. This might seem like, you know, uh, it's a, you know this is one species. We looked at one species and we maybe worked out a little bit more about how this works, but does this really contribute much more to the big picture? And at the beginning, I said that uh, it's only really brittle stars and sea urchins that have really been investigated for extraocular vision in this way. And one of the nice things that uh, we realized uh, after completing some of this study is that actually the only species of sea urchin in which uh, you know, they've been shown, to been shown to respond to the same sort of stimuli is this species, which is called Diadema africana. 
again, it's a, it's a tropical species and even more importantly, it changes colour in response to light and dark. So it could be that we've kind of um, stumbled upon uh, a, an accidental visual system again, that we know that there are photoreceptors in a lot of different urchins, but vision itself has only been demonstrated in this one uh, dark colour changing species. So that's kind of a, a bit of a whistle stop tour of, of three examples of these kind of strange distributed systems. But have we learned anything that we can kind of use to, to unify these three seemingly very different approaches to vision? I mean, importantly, we've seen that you know, all of these fundamental things that we know about conventional visual systems absolutely have to hold up if you're looking at something less conventional. So things like you know, logically using these five parameters to learn a bit more about how a visual system works, uh, these kind of fundamental, functional, and morphological uh, relationships that we see in eye structure have to hold up, uh, and things like you know requiring pigment in order to actually uh, screen your photoreceptors and produce resolution absolutely holds up in these systems as well. Something that I think is really interesting that's kind of emerged from working on a bunch of these different systems as well, and, as, and some of the ones that we've seen tonight, is that we actually also see a very broad general trend between spatial distribution and functional uh, kind of complexity and diversity. So uh, our Ophiomastix, for example, at the kind of top left of this has super dispersed photoreceptors across the entire body, but functionally it's very coarse resolution, uh, we don't really know how it works, it's, it's quite simplistic in its function. And at the other end of the spectrum, kind of if you pass through our kind of multiplied systems, you then have really uh, kind of uh, functionally uh, diverse and complex systems like those of the spiders. And we even saw this, you know, just looking at the spiders themselves, we saw this very clear relationship between uh, very distributed eyes in orb weavers through to very concentrated eyes in visual hunters. So this works at several different scales as well. And whether or not this is you know, purely because of uh, you know, the different types of visual system isn't necessarily clear. So there could be a whole bunch of different ecological, uh, developmental, evolutionary uh, constraints at work here as well. So for example, at one end of the spectrum, we have you know, much more kind of sessile, maybe sedentary animals that don't lead very active lifestyles might be more likely to have uh, simple but very dispersed visual systems. Whereas at the other end of the spectrum, we could have these very active hunters, blighted insects, etc., that have parallel visual systems and lots of different functional types, but more spatial concentration. It could also be an ecological thing. So we could be looking at you know, things that are more likely to be prey species and need to be kind of, you know, looking out for threats approaching from all sides versus things that are predators and are pursuing something they want to keep in front of them. And it could just be, uh, you know, in terms of body plans in general. So again, these distributed systems uh, rely much more on these kind of unconventional body plans, either kind of radial symmetry or uh, the lack of a head or the covering of the head with shells uh, versus this conventional kind of bilaterial body plan that we see in these uh, bottom right. So I hope that, you know, some, things are kind of becoming clearer in looking at some of these distributed systems. And, I hope that I've been able to give you a, a small flavour of some of the kind of amazing diversity that there is out there. Um, hopefully, you know, as the as, as research goes on, we'll learn more and more about them, and some of these kind of general patterns will, will come into a bit more focus. But uh, for now, I hope I've been able to kind of give you a, a a bit of a tour of what we what we do know and what we still have to find out. With that, I just want to say thank you very much. To there's been an enormous number of people involved in this work. Uh, collaborators, uh, people who willingly and unwillingly helped me at the synchrotron, uh, to everybody who's lent specimens, uh, and of course uh, to all of uh, all of those bodies that have funded this work as well. So thank you very much. Hello, hello, Lauren. Thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful tour that has taken us round all sorts of weird and wonderful beasties with many eyes. And as you can see, we have changed our position because we've gone we've gone to look for some some beasties that also have many eyes. And in the in the collection, here is a a scale worm that oh, was collected okay. from the from the Southern Ocean in 1926. And some of these have multiple uh, pairs of eyes. And we're also going to use another example to segue into a reminder. Here's some other lovely specimens we have in the museum. You can see some some types of organisms that have many eyes, the, the, the scorpion as well, but you can see there are many insects in here as well. And that's just another nudge towards a reminder that if you would like to hear what have insects ever done for us, we look forward to seeing you in two weeks time 
for Dr. George McGavin, who will be talking on that topic. And the link for that is up in the chat at the moment as I try and put that down without it breaking. Excellent, excellent. Do keep your questions coming in on the chat. We've had lots of questions. We're going to start off with one from uh, we've had a lot of love for Nicholas Cage and all oh, sorts of questions. He doesn't feature in our um, talks, I feel. <laughs> whether, whether, whether people should uh, have more eyes so that they can uh, see Nicholas Cage better. We, oh, we should also at this point give some, uh, some feedback from the poll. Um, the, the question was, um, which would be better? Um, you know, what, what, how would the Khitan see Nicholas Cage? Uh, with 78% of the vote was one big Nicolas Cage, and, and with 21% of the vote was 300 tiny Nicolas Cages. Do you want to comment on the outcome of this uh, democratic event, Lauren? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm very glad that everybody has such faith in the nervous system of Clayton's to kind of, you know, put together this amazing jigsaw puzzle. But uh, my, my personal opinion is they probably would see 300 tiny Nicolas Cages. There you have it. There you have it. And at that point, we're going to ask a question about the, the synchrotron, these high energy X-rays for looking inside these wonderful beasties. And both Mark and Jethro wanted to know, um, what kind of preservation do you need for these uh, these organisms to to get to get the resolution that you need from the synchrotron? So maybe how are these specimens preserved? I, I know myself because we spent many days um, carefully putting them into the synchrotron. But tell us how these specimens are preserved before they go into the synchrotron beam. So uh, because we were working with museum collections, a lot of the specimens that, that, that we were both using were preserved in ethanol. So this isn't usually the, the optimal way of preserving structure. So often we've used nasty chemicals like glutaraldehyde uh, and then potentially staining agents to increase the contrast as well. But uh, because I've been trusted with loan specimens from both our museum and elsewhere, we're, we're not allowed to do that. So that would be counted as destructive. Um, so ours were actually just preserved in ethanol. Often it, it's thought that that kind of disrupts the structure a little bit, but um, as you saw from some of the scans that we showed, we do actually have a, a surprising amount of preservation, even from some really old specimens. So the video that I showed was actually from a, a spider collected in 1890. So preserved exceptionally well. Uh, well, for a biologist, not a paleontologist, preserved exceptionally well for more than 100 years. Wonderful, wonderful. And Sharon, while we're on uh, on uh, eyes, and uh, Sharon wants to know, does a spherical lens give a huge field of view? Is there some advantage to having a spherical lens? Does it give you a better field of view? Good question. So it depends what surrounds that lens. So if, uh, for example, your spherical lens was sitting at its kind of widest point at the eye aperture, then you may well get a very large field of view. Uh, in a lot of these things, it sits a little bit further back. So it really depends on the, the, the angle between the, that nodal point at the center and, and the aperture itself, where the retina is. So the main benefit of the spherical lens, I think, is sort of the focusing power rather than the, uh, the field of view itself. Excellent. And then we have a question from the Netherlands, which is, if some creatures don't use their eyes or don't need them, then why take the energy to make them? Why, why have eyes if you're not going to use them? Oh, excellent question. <laughs> um, so this is something that we see uh, in the most extreme cases in, for example, animals that live in caves uh, or that live in the deep sea. And those, generally speaking, do tend to kind of lose their eyes over millions of years. The animals that I was kind of talking about in terms of being less visual, so these spiders that have uh, very similar eye structures, they're still using them in some way. So even if they're not using them to capture prey or communicate with one another, they may well still use them to detect you know, very grainy shadows or just kind of light and dark. So in a lot of these cases, the eyes are still doing something. Uh, it may not be a very sophisticated task as we think about it, but they're often still fulfilling a job. Uh, if the eyes are completely useless as they would be in a very dark environment, for example, then a lot of animals absolutely do want to conserve that energy and you know, cut their losses and get rid of the eyes. Sorry, at that point, I'm just going to remind everyone that um, Oxford University Museum of Natural History is a charity and as well as putting on public engagements events like this, we also look after a collection of over 7 million objects. We also support research and many other things. So if you are able to, please, please uh, consider donating. I am about to put a link up 
in the chat. And with that, we will carry on with a few more questions. Uh, Joe Botting, a friend to many of the paleontologists in the audience, asks a question. Do plants use opsins to detect light direction or something else? And we should say opsins are a protein that is light sensitive. So what do you think about that, Lauren? Uh, no, so light, uh, plants don't use opsins. Opsins are, are, are an animal thing, really. Um, I can't remember any by plant biology, plants use a lot of auxins rather than opsins to detect light, but that's kind of pushing my knowledge a little bit. There you go, splitting your opsins from your auxins. Very important. Hannah asks, why do some animals see particular wavelengths better than others? Oh, good question. So, I mean, for us, because we have very good colour vision, um, it's kind of difficult to imagine what your life would be like if you couldn't see quite so much. Uh, or, of course, if you could see more. So, for example, uh, I guess part of it depends on, um, you know, how, how, again, how big your eyes are, how many different kind of types of cells you can maintain, how many option sequences you happen to have can be kind of down to chance in an evolutionary sense. But also it depends how important it is to you. So. Uh, one of the kind of fundamental ideas behind why humans can see red and primates can see red, which is a, quite an uncommon thing, is um, this idea that it was possibly used for foraging and finding um, ripe fruits among trees. Uh, similarly, um, if you look for matches between, for example, um, flower colouring and flower um, patterns, you often see uh, corresponding sensitivity to those wavelengths in their pollinators. So often it's you know a particular task which is really, really important you will then uh, you know, eventually you'll be selected to be very sensitive to that particular wavelength, which is important to you. Excellent, excellent. And Stephen wants to know, do you find eye development changing drastically within families? For example, do you have particular development of eyes within families that are doing particular things? I think we're mixing together a question from Stephen and a question from Thomas there. Brilliant, both good questions. <laughs> uh, so this is actually something that I've just started working on um, in the spiders. So as of the 1st of September, uh, we are looking at differential eye development between different families of spiders. Um, so my postdoc Luish is currently um, doing a whole bunch of sequencing and in situ to look at how gene expression uh, creates these different eye patterns within families. So that's something I'll come back to you in uh, a year or so, but we are really interested in looking at exactly how development uh, directs um, you know, the adult morphology. And I think that also answers Ivo's question, which was, what were you planning to investigate in the future? Well, there you are, Ivo, you've got your answer. It's the very question we just asked there. Torsten asks, what about temporal resolution? So what about how quickly the, the whatever is viewing the world can see changes? Is there a direct relation between temporal resolution and the structure of the eye? So the structure, I'm not entirely sure you'd be able to tell, but for temporal resolution, often you can, um, you know, it, often you can kind of uh, anticipate what it might be like by a lot of the behavior of the animal itself. So. Often, if you have very high temporal resolution of a receptor, you could be really fast moving, uh, you might be really active um, or have a very high metabolism. So we can have other predictors that might um, help us anticipate what the temporal resolution might be like. So for example, I think recently there was a paper looking at um, snapping shrimp and found that they have among the highest temporal resolution of any eye. And they have this kind of, you know, um, very rapid uh, prey capture behavior. So it makes sense that they have very high resolution. Whereas something like um, the starfish, for example, have been shown to have very slow um, kind of turnover of their photoreceptors, and you know they're also moving very slowly. So that makes sense. It depends what they're using their vision for as well. So if, for example, you're using it to avoid an obstacle, that obstacle is not moving; you're doing the moving. So again, you can kind of get away with having a slightly uh, lower resolution. But if you're tracking something else and both of you are moving, you might have to have kind of finer uh, time spacing between your samples. A few f more final questions now. We go to Jethro, who would like to know, I think this is a brilliant question, what animal do you think has the most underappreciated vision? He asks, what animal surprises people when you tell them about their visual capabilities? Oh, that's a great question. <laughs> um, so I think there are some, definitely some unsung heroes of animal vision, for sure. 
Um, I think actually those, those box jellyfish are among them for me. Uh, I think jellyfish are really one of those things that people don't think about as being visual. And then, you know, having 24 eyes and four types that are able to do all these different things, like, I think that's amazing. I think they're super cool. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. And we always love the box jellyfish. Perhaps we could have another poll sometime on whether we love box jellyfish more or less than Nicolas Cage. Um, I am going to go to Stephen Bennett, who asks, humans can have blue, green, brown eyes. So we're talking about the colour of the, the pigment in the eyes, what, what we see when we look into other people's eyes. Humans can have blue, green, brown eyes. Why? And do other animals have different coloured eyes? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a good question. I'm not sure I can tell you about other animals having different coloured eyes. Um, but certainly from, from what I know about human eyes, it's uh, particular protein structures of the muscle of the eye itself. So when you can see your kind of, you know, your, your pupil um, expanding, contracting, the part of the eye that you see the colour in is, is actually those muscles. So I think it's just slightly different um, proteins that are expressed in there. I couldn't tell you about other animal eyes, I have to admit. Sorry. There you go. Ladies and gentlemen, next time you're gazing deeply into the eyes of another, think about the proteins that are making up the colours of their eye. And at that point, I think we're going to go to the final question which this week I'm going to give to Duncan Murdoch, who oh. asks, if you had, which is a modification on our usual last question, if you had to choose one group, which would it be? Chitons, brittle stars, or spiders? And I'm going to add, why? Oh, that's a... Uh... That's pretty brutal. See, chitons are my, my research home. They were where I was, you know, born and raised in a scientific context. So I'll kind of always come home to them. Um, but my, my loyalty probably lies with the spiders now, which I know is not what Duncan will want to hear as a professor at <laughs> There you go, ladies and gentlemen, moving from the chitons over to the spiders and they have uh, persuaded her to stick with it now. There you go. And perhaps um, we will hear more about the spiders in the future as your wonderful research continues. Thanks once more to Dr. Lauren Sumner Rooney for joining us this week for a wonderful talk that's taken us, given us a new view on the way people, way things see the world. A final reminder that we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks' time when George McGavin will be speaking on the topic of what have insects ever done for us? You can sign up on the link in the chat. And if you've enjoyed tonight, why not share your thoughts on social media using hashtag visions of nature. And you can see this and all the other talks again on our YouTube channel, OUMNH videos. So at that point, thanks once more to Lauren. We've loved bringing you into the museum and inadvertently you taking me. you on a bit of a tour to some of the different rooms. <laughs> Who know we may who knows we may do this again next week but at that point thank you for joining us this evening and we very much look forward to see you again in two weeks time thanks good evening everyone <laughs>